Hello and welcome to Rolling in Mills. Today we have Howard Hawke's 1940 screwball comedy, His Girl Friday. Now if you've seen any other Howard Hawke films, specifically Bringing Up Baby, then you kind of know uh, the style that this film sits in. It's very, very, very fast-paced, absurdly frantic, just these hectic plots. The way that Hawks does dialogue between characters, specifically with Cary Grant in both of those films, it's just amazing. I don't think there's just a single pause of silence in a lot of these scenes. You just have dialogue just back forth, back forth, back forth. Almost actors interrupting and encroaching on the previous lines. So you just have this like barrage of information coming at you and that's where a lot of the comedy comes from of course. John Hildy, this is war. You can't desert me oh, now. Oh, get off that trapeze. You've got your story right over there on the desk. Go on, smear it all over the front page. Earl Williams captured by the Morning Post. I covered your story for you and I got in a fine mess doing it. Now I'm getting out. The basic plot of this film is Rosaline Russell plays a, an ex-reporter who kind of gets sucked back into the business as the film goes on by her ex-husband, Cary Grant, who is the head editor of this newspaper. And basically he does everything in his power to stop her from marrying this new guy who he's going to marry tomorrow. And so the whole film is basically this conflict between her trying to leave to get on a train to get married and Cary Grant trying to stop her. You mean you're taking the sleeper today and then getting married tomorrow? Oh, well, it's not like that. Well, what is it like? But it very quickly kind of diverts from that and turns into this uh, semi-commentary on the way that the press works, the corruption, the moral degradation, the way that they can basically use and abuse these people and twist their words, which I think is a, a pretty commonly explored theme in a lot of film and media because it's kind of self-reflective, of course. I'm making it sound like it's a huge aspect of the film. It really isn't. It's more of like an underlying social commentary. And in fact, a lot of that commentary comes through in the jokes because it's basically just making fun of the way in which uh, the media acts, but in some cases, it's very black comedy. All right, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a story. I'll give you a wonderful story. Only this time it'll be true. You'll never find him now. Oh. Get the ambulance, somebody. Get an ambulance, somebody. She's dead. Oh, well, she isn't killed. She's moving. But honestly, the film isn't really even about that. I mean, plot-wise, it is. But the main attraction, I suppose, of the film is the play between Cary Grant and Rosaline Russell. Their chemistry on screen is magnetic. It's hypnotic. I mentioned the way that uh, Hawks does dialogue, just back forth, back forth, back forth, almost like a, a Jacques Tati level of just franticness. The way that they play off each other and I think this, a lot of it comes down to Cary Grant's ability. He's fantastic in both this and in bringing up Baby. And I mean, it really, it really holds the film together. I typically don't have a lot to say about actors in films. I generally prefer to critique the more technical aspects of a film, going into plot and so on and so forth. But because the film isn't really focused on that, I suppose it just means that the main attraction is the actors. And I mean, they, they pull off the performances wonderfully. Look, Hildy, I only acted like any husband who didn't want to see his home broken up. Well, what home? What home? Don't you remember the home I promised you? Sure I do. That was the one we were to have right after the honeymoon. <laughs> that honeymoon. The pace in this thing equally like a lot of screwball comedies from like uh, early 40s, late 30s is just ridiculously fast paced. I mean you, you almost do not get a break at all. I can see that irritating some people and I think it did, especially for bringing up Baby. A lot of people just find that film just a, a, just a little bit too hectic for their tastes. If you're not, you know, a big fan of that, then obviously the film, you know, you're not going to enjoy it. That's like, that's what you're getting. How do you like that? Everything happens to me. 365 days in a year and this has to be the day. And on that point, there isn't really a, a huge amount more to kind of go into beyond that. I do like some of the camera work that really accentuates how crazy this is. There's a fantastic scene where Rosaline Russell is having to pick up three different phones in the way that the cameras are swishing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It draws you in. You just feel the movement of that so strongly. And I believe Werner Herzog actually talks about that. He implies that you want your film to be uh, so magnetic that the audience wants to move in tandem with the camera's motions because they're inquisitive and they want to follow 
the characters' movements, and I think that's really what Hawks was tapping into here. Move here right away. Wait, Bruce, just a second, I'll explain everything. Walter, get this. I've got Earl Williams here. Yeah, right in the press room. Honest on the level. Hurry, I need you. Right. Bruce, the biggest thing in the world has happened. I've captured Earl Williams. You know, the murder. On top of that, there's some interesting historical points to look out for. The film was made in the 1940s, e.g. in World War II. So there's all these really interesting kind of references that form the very outer layer of the film where these characters are talking about European wars that are going on and mentioning Hitler and the Russians moving out and most importantly the Red Menace, you know, the dominoes falling, communism. And what's great is that Hawks takes that, you know, political social context and transforms it into further commentary on the moral degradation of the press and just corruption in America in general. What's fantastic is you have all these characters kind of joking about mayors and sheriffs and the press, you know, being in bed with the Reds and being on like Stalin's pay list. And the implication, of course, is that as a result of having communist ties, they're subversive and they're trying to, you know, undermine Western society and they're corrupt. But the irony, of course, is that they're corrupt and subversive anyway, regardless of communist influence. And that's just a really nice subtlety to the film, I suppose. It's one of those things where the film could have been 100% about Rosaline Russell and Cary Grant, and the story just happened to take place in the press, in the newsprinting business. But what's really cool, and just a fantastic sign of a fantastic director, is that they find ways to subtly elevate the film, even though the style of film that they're going for is meant for a wider audience. They're able to elevate the material that they have to some better plane of filmic ability and yeah I think that's about it. Overall this is an 82 out of 100 for me. I do prefer bringing up Baby just a little bit over this. I feel like the dynamic between the main characters works better there. It's a much funnier film which isn't inherently better of course but I think it's better constructed around those jokes and set pieces whereas this film does get a little bit bogged down in this one uh, location and they do make a really good use of it in these funny and creative set pieces but I think bringing up baby is just kind of on a different scale to this the wonderful thing about comedy is that it transcends time you know the Aristophanes plays from like the 420s in the BCs in Greece are still absolutely hilarious even if we don't understand every reference he's talking about this film obviously still stands up today and yeah ciao